much for the introduction. Uh, and I'd like to say thank you for the invitation as well. Uh, the results that I'm going to talk about today are part of a collaboration of 10 mathematicians, none of whom, as it happens, are French. Um, but nevertheless, it's impossible to imagine proving the kinds of results that we prove uh, without building upon the achievements of the French School of Automorphic Forms. So I'm very pleased to be able to talk about this work here today. Um, I'm going to begin by establishing some notation, which I, I apologize is going to be rather similar to uh, what Arno told you at the beginning of his lecture, but it's impossible to talk about these things without being precise. Uh, so throughout my lecture today, K will be a number field. And pi will denote an automorphic representation of GLN of the adels of K. And we'll use freely the usual set of um, mostly unramified data associated to such a thing. So there's always going to be a factorization. Let's say pi is a restricted tensor product of local representations pi v. Each pi v is an irreducible admissible representation of the corresponding local group where you interpret this in the correct way at the Archimedean places. And then for all but finitely many, so let's just say for almost all, places V of the number field. Well, the first thing you know is that V is non-Archimedean, almost always. And pi v is unramified. And that means we can define its Satake parameter. And here I'll diverge slightly from the notation used by Arno, and I'll write uh, T of pi v. OK, so this is going to be conjugacy class in GLN, complex numbers of a diagonal matrix defined up to conjugacy. And of course, in the case of GLN, this is particularly simple. It's just telling you how to recover pi v, the unramified representation, uh, as a subquotient of parabolic induction. <coughs> OK. so. The conjecture that I want to talk about today is the Ramanujan conjecture, and we already have enough to state it. So let's do that. So this, I suppose, is what really should be called the generalized Ramanujan conjecture. Because Ramanujan himself certainly didn't use the notation that I've just written down. And it says, what does it say? Suppose that our automorphic representation pi is furthermore cuspidal. Uh, and let's say if I take the absolute value of the central character of pi, then I get a uh, norm of k to the r for some real number r. So this conjecture is often stated just for uh, representations of unitary central character, but of course there's no reason necessarily to make such a restriction. And then the assertion is, for almost all v, so t of pi v is defined, uh, every eigenvalue alpha v of the Satake parameter satisfies absolute value of alpha v equals qv to the r over n, if I've got my normalizations correct. OK, and qv here is just the size of the residue field at a finite place v.
OK, so this is a conjecture. Uh, it's quite a famous one, and it's very often rather hard to say anything about it, except in certain special cases where you can prove instead another conjecture that I now want to state. Um, so I think I'll do this on this blackboard. And this is what you might call the uh, reciprocity conjecture. OK, so I'll clarify the relation between these two after I write it down. And this says, well, suppose again that pi is cuspidal, and further that it's cohomological. And just to be precise, in order to ha have to avoid introducing too much notation, I'm going to restrict cohomological to mean that pi has uh, cohomology in the trivial coefficient system. Uh, so that would be the algebra cohomology of the infinite component without tensoring with any finite dimensional representation is non-zero. Then the assertion is, and this is the reciprocity part, uh, for any prime L, And isomorphism iota between QL bar and the complex numbers, there exists a Galois representation. Let's say a continuous irreducible representation. let's say, rho pi iota, so that's the same notation as in the earlier talk, from gal k bar over k to gln over ql bar, which is a ramified at almost all places And again, at almost all places, satisfies rho pi iota of Frobenius at that place equals, and this is more or less the same condition that Arno had. It's just uh, a twist due to normalizations. So I take the Starkey parameter, and then I multiply by fixed constant. So I guess little k is the same as capital K up there? Uh, this is a capital K. Oh, it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a bit different from that capital K. <laughs> yes, I, d I don't think any small Ks will appear in this talk, so hopefully the risk of confusion is minimized. OK, so th this is the first part of the reciprocity <laughs> conjecture. The second part, which I want to add on, is that I want this representation to be motivic, which I will give a precise sense to. So this means there exists a smooth projective variety which realizes rho, rho pi i in its cohomology. Let's say x over k such that rho pi iota is a QL bar gal k bar over k subquotient of the group which I can finally fit, the atomic homology of x base change to k bar with QL bar coefficient. OK, so these are two conjectures that we believe are true. And we know some cases, as I'll get to later on. And the first remark that I want to make is that uh, 
if pi is cohomological and cuspidal, then uh, reciprocity for pi implies uh, Ramanujan for pi. And this is essentially thanks to Deline's proof of the Vey conjectures. And this is uh, the obvious generalization of a remark that was first made by Deline in the case of GL2 over Q. Uh, second remark, just in case you haven't seen uh, the reciprocity conjecture before, this is not the most general or the most precise thing that one could write down. Um, and the first formulation that I'm aware of in the literature is in uh, Clausel's Clezal, article in the uh, Ann Arbor Proceedings, where you can find uh, a more precise version of this reciprocity conjecture for any so-called algebraic automorphic representation pi. Okay, so being algebraic is a condition on the Langlands parameter of the component at infinity. I'm not going to say exactly what it is, but suffice us to say today that if you are cohomological, then you're also algebraic. So this conjecture is a special case of this one um, that's been around for quite a long time now. I don't think I understand the map one. If you do a tight twist, uh, you need to know an extra information. I'm being a bit optimistic here. Um, well, but you write <laughs> Z and you write X, A plus B. So, well, actually, no, I think it's certainly true that this one applies this one without assuming anything. Um, you may object that um, this is stronger than motivic. <coughs> the weight might be on the wrong place. Uh, no, I, d I don't think so. Well, let, let, me, let me explain my thinking. So I've stipulated that rho has to be irreducible. That means that it appears in a single cohomological degree if it appears at all. So that means rho, if it is motivic in this sense, certainly has to be pure of some weight. Right. Um, it may be the wrong weight. But then you look at the determinant of the representation. Uh, that will have weight n times the weight of rho. And I think probably what I've written down means things have to line up at the level of determinants. Okay, we can discuss that. It's also uh, cuspidal and therefore generic, and therefore there's the, uh, mm. there's the purity of uh, those that then basically fixes the, that fixes the possibility. There are, there's no ambiguity. Yes. Okay, well, we can continue to discuss afterwards. Okay. So, yes, uh, basically, uh, almost every case of the, of the Ramanujan conjecture that we know, not absolutely every case, but most cases, are proved by establishing first reciprocity and then deducing Ramanujan as a consequence. Um, anyway, let, let's, let's carry on. So... Let me write down what I just said. Most cases, of Ramanujan that we know uh, are proved by first proving reciprocity. And this was certainly the case for the original conjecture made by Ramanujan, for example, about the uh, Ramanujan delta function. And that was uh, proved by Deline, um, who constructed the uh, compatible family of Galois representations that one expects to exist. Um, but I, I want to talk about a more general example than um, just the case of GL2 over Q. In particular, I want to allow any n, because then the theory of automorphic representations is a bit more interesting. So I'm going to describe a particular set of hypotheses, which I will denote with a star for the rest of the lecture. So let's suppose uh, K is uh, an imaginary CM field.
OK? So that means it's a totally imaginary quadratic extension of a totally real field k plus. And let's suppose as well that pi is a cuspidal cohomological and finally conjugate self dual. Okay, so conjugate self dual means that. If I take pi and I act on it by the Galois automorphism, which is the non-trivial automorphism of this quadratic extension, then I get a representation that is isomorphic to the contragredient of pi itself. So in this case, uh, we can say something, and indeed have said something, uh, using a strategy that generalizes, in some sense, the original one of uh, Deline. So in this case, one can hope to descend pi to an automorphic representation Let's say capital pi of let's say G of AK plus, where G is a well chosen, I don't want to say any more than that, unitary group in N variables over K plus. And for example, if in particular you choose G so that when you look at the real points, so that's the points valued in K plus tensor R, are isomorphic to one copy of the unitary group of signature N minus 1, 1, and then some number of compact unitary groups, then uh, the general theory of how we think the cohomology of Shamor varieties should look leads you to expect that you should be able to construct the sought after Galois representation uh, inside the Atal cohomology of the Shamor varieties which are associated to G. Okay, but of course, actually carrying this out is uh, really rather non-trivial, and how many of these do I have? Uh, the first case where the strategy was carried out for general n was done by uh, Clausel again in, I guess, about 1919. And this included the condition that pi v is square integrable for some finite place v. And the reason that that condition is important is because 
It allows you to choose the unitary group G so that the associated Schmoll varieties are special cases of the so-called simple Schmoll varieties uh, first considered by Kotwitz. So this is oversimplifying a bit, but the word simple means that there's no endoscopy. And that's why it was possible to carry out this program uh, without knowing the fundamental lemma for a unitary group in a general number of variables. And of course, this was uh, almost 30 years ago now. And a lot more has been done since. So we now know. Uh, the Ramanujan conjecture for any representation pi satisfying the hypothesis star. And uh, we also know that the Galois representation exists as well. And uh, this is more or less um, the content of the first volume of the book project that Michael mentioned earlier. Um, so let me mention s some names. So certainly this is contained in, well, mostly contained in the article by Plazel, Harris, and Lebes in that volume. And there was independent work of Shin that established something rather similar. And then this constructs the Gala representation uh, in a motivic way for most pi. Uh, and to get all of the representations, you do need to use a interpolation argument using an eigen variety in a similar way to what was done during Arno's lecture. Uh, so this gives you the representations. It doesn't quite give you the Ramanujan conjecture because, as I said, not all the representations are known to be motivic, so you can't apply the Vey conjectures to those ones. So uh, the proof of Ramanujan for all pi of this type, was completed well, again by Laurent. Sorry to keep mentioning you. Uh, in I guess 2009. Yeah. And this was uh, by showing, even if you can't always show that the Galois representation is motivic, you can always show that either it or its exterior square is motivic. OK. And the reason that there's an obstruction, well, it's the same kind of sign condition that Arno alluded to earlier that it causes problems in the setting of the symplectic group, too. And the point is that if you can use the Schmoll variety of type U1n minus 1, uh, then you're happy, and you have the Galois representation. And if you can't, then you have to use something like u2 n minus 2. And that's why you find yourself with the tensor, uh, sorry, the alternating square. It's also possible to use u1 n minus 1 squared, and then you'd get uh, essentially this representation tensored with itself, or a Galois conjugate. OK, so that is uh, the Ranajan conjecture for all automorphic representations satisfying this condition that I've notated down here. But I want to talk about something new today. Uh, I want to talk about what happens when we drop the hypothesis of conjugate self-duality. And I've described this context because I think it's interesting to see 
uh, what you need to do at each stage in order to actually prove the theorem. I mean, we already have uh, the Ramanujan conjecture for some representations which uh, we don't know to be motivic, although they are close to being so. Um, but we'll see uh, for the theorem that I'm going to describe, you're very far from being motivic indeed, in the sense that I'll make precise. Okay, so we now consider a more general situation. So let me call these hypotheses star prime. And this is, suppose again, that K is imaginary CM. Uh, and suppose again that pi is uh, cuspidal and conjugate self-dual, but don't, sorry, cuspidal and cohomological, but don't suppose that it's conjugate self-dual. Uh, so now, uh, and I guess this is relatively recent, we again know that the Galois representation that you expect to exist really does exist. So that's half of the reciprocity conjecture as I stated it. And this is, was proved, well, first by Michael Harris, Kywin Len, Richard Taylor, and myself. And then afterwards, another proof, I think arguably better, was given by Schultzer. And that's the proof that I'm going to resume briefly now. And I think the strategy to prove this is quite interesting because it seems to fit nicely with uh, some other trends in the Langlands program that have appeared recently. So what is the strategy? Well, you're again going to have to use a detailed understanding of automorphic representations of unitary groups. But in this case, you need a much bigger unitary group. So you want to take the quasi-split unitary group uh, in 2n variables. And just for definiteness, let's say it's defined by the matrix uh, 0, 0, and then two n by n identity matrices. And let's take P to be the block of a triangular subgroup of G star, it's a parabolic subgroup, or what we might normally call the Siegel parabolic. It doesn't get any higher. Okay. And uh, let's take uh, M to be the block diagonal matrices inside P. So that's a levy of P. And of course, if you just look at the definition, you see that this is isomorphic to restriction of scalars of GLN from K to K plus. Okay. And I want to introduce some um, symmetric spaces as well. So let's take x, g star. So I want that to be the real manifold, which is just the complex points of the Schmoll variety of some time level. 
And let's take xp to be the symmetric space for p. So if you want, you can present this as uh, some kind of a dialectable quotient. Uh, I won't say what up is. And let's take xn to be the locally symmetric space for m, which we can again think of as a double quotient of some kind. And if you know about such things, you can think of xm as being uh, in the case where k is imaginary quadratic and n is 2 as just uh, a Bianchi manifold. So that would be a, a quotient of the usual hyperbolic 3 space by a congruence subgroup of GL2 OK or a finite union of such things. Um, P is over K plus. Everything's over K plus. Yeah. Oh, yes, AK plus, sorry. I, I missed it. Thank you. All right. So the, the idea here is that if you know something about G star, then you can know something about M. And in fact, the strategy that is used in Schultz's paper is kind of astonishingly naive. Uh, it's just amazing that it works because he's able to prove so much about the cohomology of X G star. So, what's the idea? So we have a diagram of spaces. So topological spaces, or real manifolds if you like. So I can think of xg star as being contained inside its Borel circumpactification. So that would be a manifold with corners. That contains its boundary, which is just the complement of xg star. And this you compute in terms of parabolic subgroups. So this contains xp as a locally closed subspace. And this <coughs> has a map down to xm, assuming uh, that the, the level subgroups are chosen appropriately. And using the theory, for example, of cuspidal cohomology, you can first of all show that pi, representation of uh, m of a k plus, or at least its finite part, embeds into the cohomology of x m let's say, with complex coefficients. And then using the boundary exact sequence associated with this diagram, so this is the long exact sequence of xg star embeds into xg star Borel set contains boundary. You can even show that if you take the parabolic induction from p to g of pi infinity, then this uh, appears as a subquotient of the cohomology of uh, xg star. And this is where something quite interesting happens. And I think the idea to apply a strategy like this in order to get the Galois representations that I'm trying to construct is quite an old one. But the reason why it doesn't immediately work is because while you can look at uh, let's say the Atal cohomology of small variety of g star base change to k bar q l bar coefficients and then take the part where you're finding these Hecker eigenvalues 
So because the Hecker action computes with the Galois action, this will give you a Galois representation, which should have some relation to the Hecker eigenvalues by the eichlisch mohr relation. Um, but this will never contain, or let's say, almost never contain the Galois representation that you're looking for. This, this, the original idea of using this code but it also didn't prove it. 30 years ago. <coughs> okay, sorry. The original idea of using, of, of using this uh, inclusion of the cohomology is also due to you. Was it what? It was due to you. <laughs> no, it was you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you say almost it never does? It's one dimensional? Uh, well, you, you may know that, but I, I don't know how to prove that. It doesn't work anyway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, so certainly the, the oh, no. Oh, you say, if you think it's wrong, then it did it. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, rho pi i is uh, n dimensional for me, is that correct? Yes. So it's never there. Yeah. Okay, so, so, so you, you think that this is always one dimensional? Yes, you make the computation by using the yoga from the Shimura variety. Yeah. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, uh, it, uh, it's, it's uh, basically proved by pink. It's, you have to. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Okay, well, let, let me say that I've... It doesn't work. I, I've asked people to show me how to prove that it's one-dimensional, and multiple people have asserted there is a proof, but no one's shown me a proof yet. So if somebody can show me a proof afterwards, I would I'll be delighted. <laughs> okay. Anyway. It was, but it was, it was uh, Laurent's idea. That was the... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Not that it was one-dimensional. <laughs> Regardless, we, we all agree that... Um, there are many different ways to think about this, uh, and there are good reasons why this can't contain the representation that you're looking for in general. So that might look like you're kind of stuck, because then you're going to ask, well, where else am I going to find the Gala representation? Um, <laughs> but, of course, after Vincent Lefort, we know that there are more ways than just looking at the cohomology um, to construct Gala representations, and if his theory of excursion operators could be generalized to number fields, then you'd expect to find uh, an algebra of excursion operators acting on the, the cohomology of uh, the Schmoor variety. And um, that would be, what would it be? Well, it would give you a pseudo-representation valued in the Hecker algebra. And in fact, that's exactly what Schultzer constructs in his paper. Um, so and I, I like to think of Schultzer's construction as evidence that Excursion operators do exist over number fields. Okay, so what does Schultzer do? He constructs a pseudo representation, let's say a two n dimensional pseudo representation, let's say. TG star, so as we saw in Joel's talk this morning, this is a map from the group to, so let me write it like this. So our TG star, this is the Hecker algebra which acts on the cohomology of the Schmoor variety. And here I run out of space. Okay, so again, what is TG star? It's the algebra generated by unramified Hecker operators. That's capital TG star. Little TG star is a pseudo representation which is compatible with the Hecker operators. So here. And little tg star satisfies for almost all v tg star is unramified at v and uh, t 
TG star of Frobenius is the correct unramified Hecker operator TV, which I won't define. So you, you speak of TG star as a, an algebra of excursions? Uh, yes, if you like. On um, well, th th this is the Hecker algebra of the Schmoll variety. G, G star is the unitary group. So TG star is the Hecker algebra which acts on the cohomology of the, of the symmetric space for, for the unitary group, which is the Schmoll variety. Yeah, so the fact that the double n uh, is the analog of the extortion algebra? No, no. So, so the, 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 this so far is just in the context of the Schmoll variety. We haven't kind of passed to um, the levy yet. But I guess that's the next thing to do. So th then the point is that uh, the appearance of the parabolic induction in the cohomology of the Schmoll variety, let's say xg star c, gives a homomorphism from the Hecker algebra of G star to QL bar, which is associated to the Hecker-Rangan values, let's say, of induction from P to G of iota inverse of pi infinity. Okay, so then if you just compose to get a pseudo representation of a QL bar, uh, let's say T pi infinity, so this goes from the Galois group to TG star to QL bar uh, is the one associated to um, well I guess it would be something like rho pi iota direct sum rho pi iota conjugate dual twisted by epsilon to the 1 minus n if I've remembered my normalizations correctly. So with a bit more work, once you have the pseudo-representation, you can reconstruct just the single direct sum and rho pi i. Right, so the key thing is to construct this pseudo-representation, which uh, looks like the kind of thing you'd get if you had access to the theory of excursion operators. And uh, let me just say two ingredients that go into construction, into the construction of the pseudo representation. Well, one major one is uh, Schultz's theory of perfect Hodge small varieties in the Hodge tape map. But another equally important one, uh, fr from the point of view of proving unconditional theorems, is the classification of automorphic representations of G star. So in particular, this means base change. So I don't want to attempt to provide a list of attributions for 
this statement because I don't think I know enough to get it completely correct. Um, but suffice to say, this could never have been attempted without knowing at least the fundamental lemma uh, and the stabilization of the trace formula for the unitary group. OK, so that's how you make the Galois representation. But that's not all of the reciprocity conjecture. You want to be able to prove that it's motivic. And unfortunately, uh, I have no idea how to do that, and neither does anyone else I know. Um, but we can prove uh, something that you might not expect to be able to prove, which is the Ramanujan conjecture, at least in certain cases. So this is where the list of 10 authors is finally going to appear. So that's Patrick Allen, Frank Caligari, Anna Karyani, Toby G, David Helm, Bao Lei Hung, James Newton, Uh, Peter Schultzer, Richard Taylor, and myself. Okay, so the question now is, can I fit the theorem as well as the list of names? Okay, so the theorem is, suppose uh, pi is an automorphic representation Satisfying hypotheses star prime and n is equal to 2. All right, so star prime has disappeared from the blackboard now. So if it's not in your notes, this means pi is a cuspidal and cohomological automorphic representation of GL2 of the Adels of K. And let me remind you that for me, cohomological means cohomology with coefficients in the trivial coefficient system. Uh, then the assertion is that pi satisfies the Ramanujan conjecture. Okay, um, yeah, so K can be any uh, imaginary CM field. Uh, well, and I, I guess it could also be totally real as well, but in that case, this has been known for quite some time. And let me note, in contrast to the case of cusp forms which descend to unitary groups, when we always know that either rho pi or the exterior square of rho pi is motivic, in this case, we don't know that any tensor power of the associated Galois representation is motivic. So this appears to be a case of the Ranajan conjecture that doesn't rely, at least directly, on the proof of the Bay conjectures. OK, so how do we actually prove this? Well, the thing we actually prove is that for any say m at least 1, the nth symmetric power of the associated two-dimensional Galois representation is what we call potentially automorphic. And what do I mean by this? Well, just to say something correct, let's assume without loss of generality that pi is not uh, of dihedral type. And the statement that we prove is, for all m at least 1, there exists a CM number field, let's say Km over K. And an automorphic representation, capital Pi, 
of GL m plus 1 of the adels of Km. Uh, satisfying the hypothesis star prime for GLM plus 1, and that if I look at rho pi m iota, then this is isomorphic to the restriction of the symmetric power to the Galois group of this CM extension. Okay. Now, uh, you might guess that the fact that you're replacing k with km here might cause problems with the usual application of symmetric powers to control the size of the eigenvalues. Um, but in fact, that's not the case. So you can use the results of Jacques Shalaika or Tadic on classification of, let's say, uh, unitary generic representations to show that if, uh, let's say, W is an unramified place of Km, sorry, of pi m, and beta w is an eigenvalue of the Satake parameter, then uh, the absolute value of beta w is bounded above by the square root of the size of the residue field and bounded below by 1 over the square root. But then you observe that if V is an unramified place, well, let's just say if V is a place of K below W, uh, which is unramified in pi, and alpha V is an eigenvalue of uh, T of pi V, then you can take uh, V to W to be alpha v raised to the nth power times log qv qw. That's the degree of the residue field extension. And then if you just plug this in, then you get uh, qv to the minus 1 over 2m bounds below absolute value of alpha v, bounds above absolute value of, sorry, bounds below qv to the 1 over 2m. And then if you just let m go to infinity, you get the result, namely that alpha v has absolute value 1. So that's why potential automorphy is enough. So then the question is, how do you actually prove that these representations are potentially automorphic? And well, to do that, you need to prove uh, automorphy lifting theorems and try and generalize the machinery that's been developed for uh, conjugate self dual Galois representations to this new context. And I just want to write down two of the main ingredients that go into doing that. So what goes into this? Well, an awful lot, as you might imagine. So 
So the first thing I want to mention is work by Frank Caligari and David Garrity. Um, so they have this paper which I think is called Beyond the Taylor Wilde Method. something similar. And uh, they showed how you can uh, attempt to generalize um, existing proofs of model automorphic lifting theorems beyond the setting of Schmoll varieties. Um, now, they stated the theorems which were conditional upon many hypotheses. So they didn't prove anything unconditional in this paper, which I think is now published in Inventiones. Um, but they did show somehow the path that one should attempt to follow. So then the question was, how can you actually attempt to uh, check the conditions that need to be true? Um, the next major contribution is work by Cariani and Schulze. So they proved vanishing theorems for the cohomology of Schmoll varieties. So the first paper that they proved uh, it's been published in the Annals, is about vanishing theorems for the cohomology of compact Schmoll varieties. And they show, in fact, that if you localize at a maximal idea of the Hecker algebra, which satisfies a relatively mild condition, all of the cohomology goes away except for the cohomology in the middle degree, which is an extremely strong result for uh, something like, um, well, a a a any Schmoll variety that's not one-dimensional, basically. Uh, and in work in progress, they're going to generalize this to Schmoll varieties which are not compact, although the statement is slightly different then. And this, one of the main things you do in the 10 author paper that I've alluded to here, this allows you to prove some cases of local global compatibility for the Galois representations constructed by Schultze. Even with integral coefficients and not just rational coefficients. So, uh, a major part of this is proving, for example, that if the level is maximal at the primus dividing L, then the associated Galois representations uh, are crystalline. And this is, as I say, made possible by uh, the vanishing theorems of Karajan and Schultze. Um, so those are just two ingredients. There's much more that we need to do in order to prove this theorem unconditionally. But I think that's everything that I want to tell you today. So I'll stop there. Well, I'm going to take over from the president of this afternoon session because he seems to have had a train to catch. So are there any questions? Uh, yeah. You might mention that there is another very important consequence of this construction. Um, what do you have in mind? Uh, or maybe you didn't think about it. Uh, Saturday? <laughs> yes, so you can also prove a potential modularity for elliptic curves over CM fields and Sartre-Tate as well. Are there questions, observations, suggestions? Uh, the, um, there, are, there were previous results about the local global compatibility in, uh, in Schultz. So they, they are not used here, the student of uh, Taylor's. Yes, so you're referring to Ida Varma. Um, yeah. So you use these also? Or? We use related techniques. So we, I said we use related techniques. So the first paper that she proved, she published, um, proved local global compatibility at the prime to L places uh, for the Galois representations attached to automorphic representations. So that's proved for all possible uh, local representations? Yes, uh, uh, up to controlling the monodromy operator in the Vaitalin representation. Um, but we need to know it for the Galois representations attached to torsion classes here as well as ah. rational classes. Um, but the technique that one uses to do that is very similar to what Ela does in her thesis. Um, there's also the question of um, proving, for example, that the Galois representations are crystalline when you expect them to be crystalline. And no, no I, I don't want to wish to create that impression. So I believe that Elo is working on that in a work in progress, although I, I haven't seen details myself. 
Um, we are really interested in torsion phenomena. Um, so we only prove anything in the case where we know how to formulate it, which is for Galois representations which are uh, in the fontaine lafay range. Um, so crystalline representations with Hodge Tate weights, uh, all in a bounded range, less than the residue characteristic. And do you know the eigenvalues of the crystalline phenomena? Um, I don't believe we do at the moment. And uh, I think I'll probably speak something else on the right. In the caligari Gerati argument, you also need the uh, representations associated to torsion classes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yes, and th th those were constructed in Schultz's paper. Yeah. yeah. So the, the existence of those has been known since the paper of Schultz in the Annals 2014. Well, it looks like there aren't any other questions, so let's thank Jack again. Thank you.